problem? No problem.
opportunity to come here today and dedicate Ms. Marker to that which took place in past time, preserving its history for the present and for those who come yet further along. And we recognize that your word, your people, under your guidance, followed a similar pattern throughout the history of Scripture record. Markers were placed, dedications were made, and in each instance, for the purpose of preserving that which had happened for future generations. And we thank you that we can come together today under the leadership of the Cumberland County Historical Society. And we thank you for the hard work that has been done by many different individuals to make this moment possible. And we would pause to thank you for Judge Creed Taylor and that which he did through the Needham Law School. And we pray now that you would bless us as we share in this significant moment and that you would bless all who reflect upon that which this represents to the end that we may give all honor and praise and glory to you. And we thank you in your son's name. Amen. Our first speaker is William F. Watkins, Jr., who's lived in Farmville since his early teens and is a graduate of Farmville High School, Hamilton Sydney College, and the University of Virginia Law School. He passed the Virginia Bar in 1950 and was a sole practitioner until his retirement in 1999. He was on active duty with the U.S. Navy during World War II and as a retired Lieutenant J.G. Mr. Watkins is the former mayor of the town of Farmville and has served as the Prince Edward County's Commonwealth Attorney from 1963 to 1991. He is a member of the Farmville Presbyterian Church where he is a Sunday school teacher, a past deacon, and a past active member of the session as well as a substitute lay speaker. Mr. Watkins is a former Virginia J.C. and a present member of the Lions Club. He serves on the board of directors of Southside Community Hospital as well as Wachovia Bank. Mr. Watkins and his wife, Norma, have three children and five grandchildren. The Watkins family has resided in Prince Edward County since 1754 and five generations of the family have served in various elected offices as sheriff and judges and members of the Virginia Senate and the House of Representatives. The office of Commonwealth Attorney was held for three generations of this family for a total of 100 years. 
be here today to participate in this debt service. I think it's particularly important and good today that we are having this service since we can't have it in Needham. That we're having it at this historic and honored Common Prayer Church, which bears a Memories of British historical importance. I'd like you this afternoon, if you will, to close your eyes for a minute. Imagine that you have, in 1830, you have decided to make a Sunday afternoon visit to Judge Creed Taylor at his home in Needham. As you close your eyes, of course, you forget about the electricity in this building and you forget about the television and the radio. You didn't have cars to ride here. You had to either walk or ride horseback or come by carriage. Or perhaps you came by a stagecoach over the road in front of here, which was the stage road from Washington, D.C. to Millersville, Georgia. It's a dirt road, and, but it's a good road because much of the traffic going north and south came in front of this church. As you came from Cumberland or from the north, you passed by the busy little community of Rain's Tavern. Now, Rain's Tavern is a very important stage stop. As indicated, he has a nice tavern and with good food and good accommodations and all kind of things that are necessary for travel. In addition, that Rain Tavern is a very busy little place because there was a wheelwright shop and a tail shop, a tan yard, a factory, a shoe factory, a hat factory, and a lumber yard. And one addition they had at Rain Tavern was a one half mile race course, horse race course, that attracted horses all the way from Pimlico and the north to New Orleans in the south. If you came from Farmville, Farmville was just a small community. It's just a small community. It's not the courthouse, but it's growing rapidly with various industries and with a number of new houses and businesses. One of its main claims is that it is the head of navigation on Appomattox River, and most of the tobacco that moves from this area in South South Virginia goes down that river by bateau or by bar. But of course you came to see Judge Taylor. Judge Taylor is a charming 64-year-old man at this time. He has on a coat and knee breeches, white stockings, has silver buckles on his at his knee. He has his hair, he has white hair, and his hair is kind of down, has a little cue in the back, kind of like, like a child, I reckon. Now, Judge Taylor is a charming person, a delightful conversationist, although as he gets a little older, he, because of ill health, he's got to be a little content. But let me tell you a little bit about Judge Taylor. He was born in 1766 in Cumberland County. He was one of five children born with the marriage of Samuel Taylor and Sophie Taylor. He is related to Pres President Zachary Taylor. At the age of 10, he probably standing in front of the courthouse in Cumberland on April 5, 1766 when the committee of citizens of that county announced its instructions to the representatives of, to the Virginia Convention discussing independence. And I would like to read to you this declaration. We therefore, your constituents, instruct you positively to declare for independence that you solemnly adjure the allegiance to his Britannic Majesty and bid him good night forever. That you promote in our convention the instruction to our delegates now sitting in the Continental Congress to do the same. We are told that this was the first positive order in the United States given to independence 
by any official body. Can you imagine the excitement of the people and young Creed Taylor hearing these words for freedom, words which shaped his full life and his future? Although Creed Taylor apparently did not serve in combat, he served for a time in the Continental Army. Without a great deal of formal education, he began working in the Turks office of Cumberland County under the auspices of George Carrington, the church, the clerk. After Mr. Carrington's death in 1784, he served as deputy clerk under the, the, Mr. Carrington's successor, Miller Wilson. It might note also that Creed Taylor was took advantage of all his opportunities. He married Judge Wood, I mean, Clerk Woodson's daughter, Sarah. And there he spent much of his time. At those times, there were no law schools, and in order to get a legal education, many uh, fledgling lawyers studied law under the clerk. The clerk of the court who did not only serve as clerk, but also did a lot of the legal work. And this is the way young lawyers became educated. Creed Taylor was appointed a coroner in 1786, and in 1791, he qualified in the court in Prince Edward County to practice law. He was an able attorney, and in 1802, began a law practice in the High Court of Chancery in Richmond and in the Federal District Court. As you can imagine, this fledgling lawyer took an active part in politics. He was elected to the House of Delegates in 1788, served in the Virginia, State, Virginia Senate from 1798 to 1805, and was speaker of that August body from 1804 to 1805. He was a close personal friend of his neighbor, John Randolph, who lived in Bazaar. And in a debate between Randolph and Patrick Henry in Charlotte County, he assured others of Randolph's ability and was heard to tell out, out the onlookers that Patrick Henry was getting a little senile. <laughs> he rendered a great service in this area, served on commissions to settle Virginia lines of Tennessee and Kentucky, was a trustee for the establishment of the town of Farm was involved on plans for the, to connect, have a, connect, a canal, canal connecting the Appalachian River, and was selected as commissioner to select the site of the University of Virginia. If I might have a personal note, my, grand, my great great grandfather, Henry E. Watkins, also served on that commission. It, is noted, it should be noted that they finally decided under the auspice of Thomas Jefferson, who was chairman of the committee, to locate the University of Virginia in Charlotte. During his lifetime, he had an opportunity to show, associate with and work closely with Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and James Monroe. In fact, he served as one of the electors of Thomas Jefferson in the election of 1800. But Judge Taylor's destiny lay in the judiciary. In 1805, he was appointed judge of a general district court. And in 1806, he succeeded George Will, an able Virginia jurist, as chancellor of the high court in Richmond. When he was appointed, the act directed that the judge should reside in the place where the court sat. In this case, Richmond. Judge D. Taylor then moved from Richmond, moved to Richmond in 1814. Later, however, in the, the legislature also directed that, that Lynchburg be added to the jurisdiction, and so Judge Taylor moved back to Needham. Now, this caused some problem with the legislature, and they haven't directed that he should reside where his court was. He entered in an opinion saying it was impossible to live both in Richmond and in Lynchburg. And he said it would be better to live in the middle, so he moved back to Newton. <laughs> he is noted for his fair opinions and very prepared, very well prepared opinions, which have been quoted many years 
sets that time. As we say, he got a little feisty toward the end of his life. At his last occurrence in Lynchburg, he adjourned it. The, the court was adjourned until 12 the next morning. Becoming rather restless, about the hour of 11, he caused the courthouse bell to be rung long and loud. In great haste, the lawyers came running to meet his ireful glance. He reproached for one lawyer for being dilatory, to which the lawyer said they were supposed to meet at 12. Judge Taylor replied, gentlemen, I have in the future, that I will have you know in the future that when I take my seat in this bench, it will be 12 o'clock. <laughs> of course, one of the great contributions that Judge Taylor made was the establishment of Needham Law School. And Judge Upshaw will tell you, Reverend Upshaw will discuss that. Judge Taylor died in 1836. Although he and his wife and Sarah Woodson had no children, they raised five young children, five young relatives. He, of course, is buried at Needham. Cumberland County, as well as South Virginia, South South Virginia, and Virginia as a whole. And we, as citizens of this great commonwealth, should take pride, great pride in having men such as Jerry Taylor who preceded us and left us a price of heritage. Thank you very much.
Legend has it that two brothers left England in 1636 to escape a cruel stepmother. One brother settled on the eastern shore and became the Upshur family, U-P-S-H-U-R. The other settled in Gloucester, Virginia and became the Upshaw family, U-P-S-H-A-W. Obviously, the Upshur family was the wealthy part of the family. <laughs> Abel Parker Upshur was born on 17th of June, 1790 in Northampton County, Virginia. He was admitted to the bar in 1810. He practiced law in Richmond. President John Tyler appointed him Secretary of the Navy in 1841. And in 1843, President Tyler appointed him as Secretary of State. His work entitled An Inquiry into the Nature and Character of the Federal Government is still used by law scholars today. He and several other cabinet members were killed when a test gun aboard the USS Princeton exploded during a test cruise. President Tyler was on board the cruise, but he was below deck at the time and escaped injury. Creed Taylor opened his law school in 1821 at his home here at Needham at the age of 55, probably to supplement the meager income that the uh, judges received at that time. He approached law as a science and was disturbed at the confusion and looseness which had crept into the courtroom. To correct the situation, he established the second law school in Virginia and the fourth in the country. William and Mary was the first school of law in Virginia. Taylor intended to limit the number of students to 15 because the young town of Farmville was not yet able to accommodate more students. But the school opened with 21 students and had as many as 50 students at one time. Some of the students who studied law under Creed Taylor came from Hampton Sydney College. As the school grew, five or six cottages were built to house the students. Each cottage housed from two to four students. These cottages no longer exist. The students evidently took their meals with the Taylor family. Sessions lasted from early March until late December. Students would pay $50 a year in advance, and board was around $150 a year. I can't imagine being back there at that time um, and studying in that kind of atmosphere, but um, Farmville was a small town and was not able to accommodate that many students. Students were not required to meet any religious or political test. Do they today? Do you guys have to pass any <laughs> religious or political test today? Mm -hmm. I didn't think so. <laughs> in that age, an age of religious fervor, Many people in the neighborhood around Niebuhr, uh, Needham regarded the school as a den of free thinkers and a challenge to their religious beliefs. And you say we still don't require that, is that correct? <laughs> Students would study three courses with a series of books in each course. One day in every month was set apart for the examination of students. But the uniqueness of Taylor School was found in his moot court. Taylor School was the second in the state, but probably the first, and probably the only in many places, to use the moot court system as the basis of instruction. A county monthly court, a county quarterly court, a county superior court, a general court, a superior court of Chaucery, and a Supreme Court of Appeals was held so that the student would have practice in all levels of Virginia courts. Taylor occupied the position of judge, and the students selected from their number a clerk, a sheriff, and a magistrate. One of the students would represent the plaintiff and another the defendant. Each student would prepare his pleadings, which would be submitted to the judge. Great care was taken to make the trial proceeding seem as real as possible. All the evidence was reduced to writing in the form of depositions. In the preface to his journal of the law school, Taylor wrote that the school would be, quote, for the purpose of aiding and assisting in the art and science of pleading. In other words, to instruct him how to conduct the business of a client agreeably to the rules of law and the mode of practice in our courts. 
students only had to attend Needham on examination days and court days. They could study in his office any time they wished. The law offices where the moot courts were held, kitchen and student colleges, no cottages, no longer exist. The law office stood in the right-hand corner of the lawn in front of the house. The house is a two-story frame structure with outside chimneys built prior to the Revolutionary War. A hall runs through the middle and a very large room on each side of the hall on the first and second floors. The mantelpieces are of the colonial type. There was a large basement which was used as a dining room. The house fronts on the north and had a porch on both front and rear. Let me pause here if I might as I remember Susie Bonner who spent a great deal of time and energy in restoration of that home. And before she died, she was aware that this marker would be placed there. But she had a real heart for that place, trying to sell it, but she refused to sell that house to anyone who did not respect the historical nature of it. And I wanted us to be aware of that. There is no complete list of students who attended the school during its 15-year history, but it is safe to say that between 300 and 350 young men received their training at Needham. In a growing country with an evolving legal system, there is no way to determine the impact this school had on our history. Governors, state Supreme Court justices, congressmen, and many distinguished lawyers studied under Taylor. James T. Moorhead of North Carolina, a former student, wrote the following to Judge Taylor. When I see not only in this state, but in her sister states, the bench and bar, adorned in the one place and honored in the other, with talents that cast a light, I am under the impression that you, as the primary cause of their success, merit the esteem of every friend of this country, for surely none can profit her more than by preparing her rising youth. One of the most valuable products of Creed Taylor School was his Journal of the Law School. It is a leather-bound volume, very much like any other law book. It contains the proceedings of the moot court during the first year the school was conducted. The cases were entered much like the orders of a regular court. Many lawyers found this volume an authoritative guide in preparing their cases. Judge Taylor intended to write four of the volumes in order to include every order in the common cause course of proceedings that would take place in a Virginia court. Copies were sent to Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, both of whom wrote letters to express their thanks for his great work. Creed Taylor said in regard to this journal, Should my efforts to bring this noble profession of the law to something like a correct system of pleading, and that very meritorious and distinguished class of gentlemen, the clerks of our courts, to a uniform methods of entry, and of making out complete records, succeed in any degree, I shall be most amply rewarded. Creed Taylor died on January 17, 1836. He was buried here at Needham in an unmarked grave about 100 yards south of the residence. His obituary described him as a man who, quote, with little aid from early education, with none from wealth or patronage, filled with ability, servile of the most important posts in the service of his native state. His influence goes on for the principles of the law which he instilled into his students, and the high sense of honor which he always gave. This he has passed on since to successive generations, so that this influence in ever-widening circles flows outward and onward to enrich the commonwealth and the nation. I must admit that in studying this history and about this man and this school, I was not aware of what has taken place right here in our midst. But who is to know what influence this school had on our country, on our nation, on our freedom? 
and today we celebrate that and i think it's very important that we not forget that we not forget the price of that freedom that we not forget those who carved out of the wilderness a legal system that we might be able to have the freedoms we have today very happily we do today bring recognition to a man and to his work and i trust and pray that the diligence that he gave to our legal system would live on
this afternoon, we have a copy of a booklet that was printed in 1935 by the Farmville Herald that we were given permission to reprint. We have a copy for each family in attendance today. Once every family has received their copy, if there are any left, extra copies can be purchased for $5, a $5 donation to the Cumberland County Historical Society. The realtor has agreed to have Needham open this afternoon, from 3.30 this afternoon until 5, so that we can, if we would like, go down and view the property, not as a prospective buyer, but as preservers of history. For those of you that may not know where Needham is as you leave the driveway, if you'll turn to the right, just past WFLO's tower, there's a pull-off on the right-hand side of the road. If you'll look to the left, there's a small sign showing you the entrance to Needham. I want to thank you for coming and being with us this afternoon. And you know, it sort of sunk with me a little bit this past week. We never know what might disappear tomorrow that we have today. Thank you for coming and drive safely home. I didn't realize some years ago that I had the privilege of being in Needham before I realized all of this that I've learned in this process. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Dear God, we thank you for the vision of Creed Taylor, who saw a need and then went about doing something to address that need. We thank you for his courage, for often it's one thing to have a vision, it's another thing to have the courage to go through what it takes to fulfill that vision. We thank you for those who had the vision to see the need of restoring that place. And we thank you for those who had the vision of the need of this marker. I guess what we pray today in closing is that everyone who looks at the marker will be able to have the courage of their visions to fulfill them on behalf of this society. In your name we pray. Amen.
just trying to get the uh, flavor of everybody that's here.
but a cedar tree. Shining in the lens. Mm -hmm. You both have an eye. <laughs> I know you have a wonderful one. I just wish it had a porch on it, you know, on this side. But she didn't have enough money to do it after she made the room. Honey, I can't do it. This place has a appliance dealer here in town. You know, that's the original part of the house. You said that's original? Yeah. Yeah. It sure has elaborate work on it, doesn't it? The woodwork. Excuse me? Elaborate woodwork. Um, Very elaborate. That the woodwork is original too. Yeah, I believe so. And look at the big, mm -hmm. what do you call it? Wainscot? Mm -hmm. Horizontal wainscot. Mm -hmm. That is Now, really Sid's bedroom's got the plaster peeling, so. And the windows, the yeah, six Yeah, well, you're going to like the staircase. Classic for the period. The hearth. <laughs> Probably the original hearth. I think so. The way it's cracked. I remember sitting in here with the fire going. Well, you took the hearth. Yeah. The neatest thing about these old houses, when they're owned by people that appreciate them is that they don't destroy it. You'll get a good shot, kind of an interesting shot like here's an up and here's the stairs.
get out of here. All right, Billy. This is this is the boxwood tree. The holly tree is to my left, right over here. That's the big holly tree. And another boxwood right there. 